Our first feature is Albert Brooks. Al Brooks is the co-founder of the African-American Democratic Club of Prince William County. He's the CEO of Progress Through Training. He's the recipient of the Mayor Derrick Wood Foundation Unsung Hero Medal. His name has been entered into the congressional record by Congressman Gerald Connolly. Several recognitions and commendations as the chair of the Prince William County African-American Democratic Caucus. His work is so eloquently noted by his mentor, who said, nothing counts but pressure, pressure, more pressure, and still more pressure. That's A. Philip Randolph. And what we can say about Albert Brooks in Prince William County is he applied pressure and he continues to apply pressure. Oh, you grew up as the son of a pastor. So can you talk a little bit about some of the lessons that you learned and how it prepared you for what you had seen in the rest of your life? When I grew up, I grew up in a, initially in a pretty rough neighborhood. Called a dead stack Brooklyn. And uh, like all the young men there, the brothers, I started off on the wrong path. And one day, several hundred of us were getting ready to do something awful. And a brother named Malcolm X pulled up, <laughs> ran in the middle of us with some of the fruit of Israel. I didn't know he knew my father. <laughs> so he kept us from hurting our brothers. That's what he said when he got out of the car. He said, Don't you hurt your brothers. Love your brothers. Work together and break up this y'all get ready to do. When I got home, my dad already had the news. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he said that he had a phone call from a friend of his named Melvin. And he said, son, pack your bag. And so I packed my bag and I was on a train headed for Detroit, Michigan <laughs> the next morning where I lived with my uncle and aunt for two years. And at that time, I got an opportunity to go to uh, Reverend Franklin's church there in Detroit, Aretha's father, where I met Malcolm, some of his family there. I also met uh, many entertainers. Some of them called the Temptations and others. So I started singing in a choir. I didn't even do that at home in my father's church. <laughs> <laughs> and I started learning to work with people to try to do some good instead of what I was learning on the streets of New York at first, <laughs> which was to own the streets. So I stayed there two years, then I came back to New York. My dad moved the family to Buffalo, where we um, went at a Went to high school, went, met my wife, played sports, became the president of the NACP high school chapter there in Buffalo, and went on to the university. And, but while the NACP high school chapter 
We started in chapter, you saw some of that when you was at the house. We were the ones that did a lot of the integration stuff there in Buffalo. Matter of fact, we had hundreds of members. So when we went to the, to the college, University of New York, we became the NACP college chapter. And from that perch, we took on mayors, unions, and anyone else who did not allow our people to have an equal opportunity to be at the table. So can I ask you a question? So you talk about being a member of the NAACP with your high school, right? Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk to us about some of the challenges you faced in high school and some of the issues that were going on in Buffalo, New York, you said, right? But is Buffalo, some, New York, right? some of the issues in Buffalo, uh, like many, many cities, they had some problems assimilating and integrating different facilities and places. I was fortunate enough to have a football coach and um, other, some ministers and some others who were my mentors. My dad won because he was in the NACP. He was a vice president. And that's how he got me to be, <laughs> to join the NACP in high school. And we, we took on integration issues. We took on issues of racial discrimination by the police. We made up our minds in high school that we were going to put minorities at the table throughout the city elected officials. So when we went to college, the, um, they didn't have a board of supervisors, but they had a city council. And it was white. <laughs> By the time we left, after being the NACP college chapter, and many of you may have heard of us, uh, they called us the Young Turks. Mm -hmm. We went after everybody. Dick Gregory, who was a comedian and social activist who lived from 1932 to 2017, said, to be forced to vote for the lesser of two evils is really to have no choice at all. Under such circumstances, the only real choice a person has is to exercise his right not to vote. Boycott the polls and refuse to participate in the process that mocks the concept of free elections. Albert Brooks has been a civil rights activist for 50 years. His contributions to get out the vote efforts in Prince William County has been instrumental in increasing voter turnout, especially amongst people of color. During campaign election season, Albert Brooks, he applies pressure, organizing voter registration drives, voter engagement, and outreach efforts and canvassing events. Initially, I lived in a project, but we, we, we didn't live that long because my mother said, no, you, you, we, we gonna move. So we moved into a very nice neighborhood. 
And then we started moving out. In other words, we were integrating across the north side of Buffalo. And what was that experience like when you integrated with people within the Buffalo community? Did you well, see the it racism? Was, it was um, initially, it was problematic, but the way that we did it, we just took over whole communities. Mm. For one thing, we outnumbered many folks, and the white community was not a united white community. You had sections of Italians, you had sections of Polish, you had of Irish, etc. So I want to move further as you talked about, you know, being able to bring people to the table. Yeah. And this led you to working for people such as, you know, the, the famous civil rights activist A. Philip Randolph, eventually the Legal Defense Fund, and then in 1971, part of Buffalo Front of Action Group. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like when you were working for the Front of Action Group in Buffalo and how you were opening the door for many blacks well, at that time? We, when, when I began, I began first in that high school chapter and where I worked with the NACP, the NACP then, some kind of way, after they saw what we were doing, they introduced our names to Mr. Randolph, A. Philip Randolph. Mm -hmm. Mr. Randolph sent a guy named Ernest Green Formerly used to be of the Little Rock Nine. Hmm. One day he showed up in this place where our group used to go every night. Mm -hmm. He showed up there and interviewed me. Mr. Randolph had said, and said, you know, I got to be back in New York now. He, what he was doing, he was interviewing me to work for A. Phillips. And I found out William Coleman and Thurgood had told Mr. Randolph. And your Thur Thurgood Marshall. Told Mr. Randolph about this group that was doing a whole lot to put black folks at the table. So Mr. Randolph hired me as his, uh, one of his field reps. My responsibility was to organize black folks to go into the building and construction trade unions and then to other employment situations throughout the western New York area from Niagara Falls all the way over to the Pennsylvania line and all the way to Rochester. And then when they, we, we started doing that and they liked what we were doing, we met, they had a meeting I think it was in 1967. And they called us to Albany to meet with a guy named Nelson Rockefeller, the governor. And what they wanted was to begin an affirmative action program for the whole Western New York area. Mm -hmm. And when we left that meeting, I was the executive director for a fourth of the state of New York. So our job was to figure out how we were going to put our brothers and sisters at the table. And we figured it out, and along with the governor, 
We told them we want 600 brothers and sisters, not sisters at that time. Later on, we brought sisters in. Brothers in the unions, every six months, we wanted 600 of them in there. So we, f we came up with formulas on how to do that. Now, the, 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 it wasn't as easy as I'm making it sound because some of the people we dealt with were not too, they, they were not too excited about putting black folks and brown folks in there with them. They didn't even want each other in there. <laughs> Mr. Randolph was a product of the Chicago area. He began the Pullman Porters on the railroads in 1930. And all them porters and stuff that you saw in the movies and things, well, he made those people, he, he unionized them, made them a part of the, the um, AFL-CIO, one of the first minority unions. And he also worked with, when he moved to Harlem, he worked with Thurgood and all of those guys to, um, put the building trades and stuff to integrate them throughout the Northeast at first. And he, he um, his saying was, put your brothers, and he always said sisters, at the table so that they can determine their destiny. Right and then help determine the destiny of their people. When, when I'm working here to put people in different positions here, yes. it's the same thing. Uh, I want to read a quote from Mr. Randolph in the time that we are remaining. And he says, one of the famous quotes, equality is the heart and essence of democracy, freedom yeah. and justice equality of opportunity in industry and labor unions, schools and colleges, government politics, and before the law. Right. There be, must be no dual standards of justice, no dual rights, privileges, duties, or responsibilities of citizenship. There can be no dual freedoms. Say, how can we apply that to today's generation? Well, you, what you do, when I, when, when, when Willie Tony and I began here, mm -hmm. None of these folks that are in office, black folks, yes, sir. all of the folks on the board of supervisors were white. Mm -hmm. All of the folks on the school board was white. The Dumfries Town Council was white. Willie Tony and myself began this group here to put our brothers and sisters at the tape. See, the simple thing that, that what you said is, is his background, but it, what he told us to always go for was the simple thing. Work to put your brothers and sisters at the table. And he taught us that, I guess, when we were about 20 years old or so. And that's what we did. We started putting, we worked, when we left Buffalo, New York, the mayor was black, the police chief was black, the chairman of the city council was black, and most half of the council was black. That's that's what he taught. 
And wherever we went throughout New York, we did that. They called us the Turks because we never saw a fight that we ran from. You have to remain united and you have to always remember you got to outthink that fella. Because he believes he's superior, but I don't believe it. You know, I went into a meeting one time in a, with, a, with a building trades president, myself and three of my colleagues took out a gun and put it on his desk, going to intimidate me. I smiled him again. I said, you know, we, 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 we can meet on this subject another time. Today might not be the best time. <laughs> so I, I kind of exited his office. <laughs> and that, and, and um, a week later, when I came back, it wasn't just the four, it was eight. He took that pistol, put it on his desk again, and when he did that, I just turned like that and opened my coat. He looked up at a 45. <laughs> then he looked, there was seven more of them over there. <laughs> <laughs> he put that thing back in his desk. Mm -hmm. He had to break me. <laughs> but that's, that's how we that's how we did things in New York. And everybody knew that when we said something, you better listen. And you always have to remember that you just got to outthink the opposition. Learn what's necessary to carry out the programs that you want to carry out. All of us have to work together and all of us have to speak of one, with one mind at putting our people at the table. When you do that, your results will be, you, you'll get good results. And if you look at the county now, when Willie and I started, there wasn't no black folks <laughs> sitting at none of them tables. <laughs> All we have to do is remember, mm -hmm. we are, as a people, strong. But we have to make sure that we have a united front. And when you say something, make it happen. How did you know that this work was your passion and your purpose, and ultimately, your legacy. I, I listened to A. Philip Randolph, and I listened to Thurgood Marshall. And I enjoyed <laughs> the challenge. Um, when, when I, as a young man, I don't know if it, my sister from New York would understand. <laughs> they got some, they got some white folk in New York, the mafia <laughs> 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 And 
Maka Luzunair. enjoyed the challenge of confronting the mafia. Mm -hmm. We didn't give a care about them cats just like they didn't give a care about us. The, the folks that used to be looking at us from up here mm -hmm. were looking at us from across the table. Mm -hmm. See, that, that to me I always considered it a challenge, and I, I always considered that the that my people were foremost important to me, and I wanted them to have the same thing that everybody else had. How did you make that transition? So you were working for um, A. Philip Randolph, and then you transitioned from that and went to the federal government to advocate. Well, so what, what happened is Nelson Rockefeller had our backs in New York. When he decided that he wanted to be a vice president, he brought his team with him. He, he called me one day. I was having lunch and said, Al, when can you come to Washington? I told him, I got, uh, I got to make a phone call before I can answer that, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> I had to call back. <laughs> <laughs> so I called her and she said, you know, I expected him to call you. <laughs> Tell him you can come. When does he need you? I said, well, he said something about next week. She said, tell him he'll be there. Mm -hmm. I've been here ever since. <laughs> they wanted us to, to go and do what we did in New York all over the place. And they sent us to Alabama, Georgia, and places like that. It just so happened we did organize and make things possible with the help of many, many people. A lot of them sitting in this room. The battle to gain equity for minorities has and continues to be the dominant theme in Al Brooks' life. He deserves to be acknowledged for his 50 plus years of service to the state and Prince William County. At 77 years young, he gets up every Monday through Saturday, sets up his table in front of the DMV on Canton Hill Road in Prince William County, greets people with good morning, good afternoon, or hello, and follows up with, are you registered to vote? Albert's legacy is his leadership and commitment to our community. Al continues to apply pressure by teaching the next generation how to apply pressure. And because of him, we are applying pressure. Well, thank you all for inviting me.